The way we generally use the term cult was not common before the 20th century. All of the groups in this video came before 1900, but I am still using the term because they were all religious groups not accepted by the society they were in. This lack of acceptance led to their destruction. As a disclaimer, I've never been a religious man, but I have no issue with anyone who is. Religions are just a special interest of mine. So let's get going. The first couple hundred years of Christianity were pretty chaotic. Many authorities, including the Romans, did not look kindly upon Christians. They were seen as fanatics, following an offshoot of Judaism. In the early 300s, Christianity really began to become accepted, especially after the Roman Emperor Constantine converted to the religion. There was an issue at this time, though. There had not been a real central authority in Christianity up to that point. Different groups of Christians had very different interpretations of the religion. At the time, they didn't even all use the same Gospels in the religious text. Some left Gospels out that are in the modern Bible, and some had Gospels that are no longer widely used. These extra Gospels are often referred to as the Biblical Apocrypha. There are a lot of them. Fourteen of the Apocrypha are still sometimes used in printings of the King James Bible and other Bible versions. Depending on how you classify them, there are over 50 Apocryphal books. Archaeologists even find new ones in ruins or very old libraries from time to time, like the Gospel of Judas, which was found in the 1970s. We aren't going too deep into that today. It's a huge rabbit hole that people spend their whole careers on. But it's important background information for this story that you know that these and other major differences existed at the time. They were still trying to agree on what books should be in the Bible, let alone what all the tenets of Christianity should be. These divisions went much deeper. Bishops at this time often disagreed on the very nature of Jesus and God. These disagreements were getting so severe that they got back to Emperor Constantine. So, in 325, Constantine called for the First Council of Nicaea. This was a meeting of somewhere around 318 bishops to agree to some standards. The goals of this meeting included everything from banning the clergy from castrating themselves to working towards setting a date for Easter. At the time, the date for Easter was based on when the Jewish community decided to have Passover. This council and several following councils created the basis for the canon that the Catholic Church, the Orthodox Churches, and most of the Protestant churches that broke off from them would use. This included things like how to train clergy and which books should be in the Bible. One of the other things these councils established is the Trinity. That is that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three equally divine entities. There were several other ways of looking at God and Jesus that were common at this time. It's hard to know how many schools of thought there were on this. A lot of this information was suppressed and there could have been more that we do not know about. These schools of thought are often referred to as heresies. Some of them are just a little different from the Trinity. For instance, Sabellianism said that Jesus was God himself taking on a form to talk to the people of Earth. There was also Monophysitism and Adoptionism that in different ways said that Jesus was conceived as a human and then made godly. The one that was considered to be the worst heresy was known as Arianism. And I already know what you're wondering about. The Arianism in this is spelled with an I, not a Y. It has nothing to do with the other stuff. Arianism was called that because their leader was named Arius of Alexandria. His followers probably didn't call themselves that, though. Among other things, Arius taught his followers that God created Jesus, and then through Jesus, God made the Holy Spirit instead of them all being eternal. Meaning that they thought that God was the only true God, and Jesus served him and the Holy Spirit served both of them. Arius had quite the following. He and his supporters would go around and argue with the other bishops in Alexandria. These arguments got big enough that Constantine heard about them and it became a major reason for him calling for the First Council of Nicaea. Arius was invited as one of the attendees of the council. There he argued for his beliefs. And he mostly just made people mad. Supposedly, he was even slapped by St. Nicholas. Side note, there are a bunch of different versions of St. Nicholas's story and they are all fascinating. They range from him saving girls from prostitution and throwing gold into their window, to resurrecting children killed by a serial killer. Fun! After all was said and done at the council, Arius was exiled to the Roman state of Illyricum, which was the area on the other side of the Adriatic Sea from modern Italy. He later hid out somewhere in Palestine for a few years until Constantine allowed Arius to come back. Then as soon as he got back, Arius was most likely poisoned by an enemy. In the years following this, Arianism actually gained some traction thanks to Constantine's son and a few other leaders sympathizing with them. That came to an end, though, with the emperors Valens and Theodosius I. Valens began by exiling bishops who did not follow the creed of Nicaea. Then, after Valens died in battle, Theodosius took over becoming the last emperor to control the whole Roman Empire. One of his first acts was effectively banning the Arians through decrees and through the First Council of Constantinople in 381. The Arians in the empire either had to convert, go into exile, or die. The tradition was carried on for a while by Germanic tribes like the Visigoths and the Vandals, who cared very little about Roman authorities. The Visigoths went on to convert to the Nicene Creed in 589, and the Lombards were the last tribe to convert in the late 600s. Arianism got a little interest during the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s and into the Enlightenment in the 1700s, and 1800s, but mostly from nerds. A theologian named Lelio Sozzini and his nephew Fausto 
wrote their own Arianism-based texts in the 1550s. These writings became a curiosity to other theologians and later people like Isaac Newton and John Locke, but I can't find any real examples of Arianism becoming a real sect or denomination again. This treatment of the Arians by the Romans really set a tone for how things would go for people trying to diverge from mainstream Christianity in the future. Which brings us to our next topic. In very basic terms, Crusades were wars fought on behalf of the Latin Church during the Middle Ages. The Roman Catholic Church actually has 24 churches within it that are considered to be in full communion with each other. Most Catholics are part of the Latin Church, though. Generally, when people think of Crusades, they think of the wars followers of the Church fought to try and claim the Holy Land. There were, however, many other wars that are considered Crusades. There were many waged against pagans, against unpopular rulers, and in general to maintain the authority of the church and its favored rulers. The one we are interested in is the Cathar Crusade. The Cathars were a religious group, mostly in southern France and in northern Italy, from the 1100s to the early 1200s. Also, they didn't call themselves Cathars, they referred to themselves as good Christians, but that could get confusing, so we are sticking with Cathars, which is what other people called them. The Cathars were not a very unified religious group, but they were believed to have followed a form of Gnostic Christianity. Gnosticism is another school of thought that was considered a heresy, like Arianism. Unlike Arianism, though, Gnosticism has maintained more of a following even into the modern day, with there still being active groups like the Mandians. There are a lot of different versions of Gnosticism, but they all believe some form of what is called Gnostic cosmology. The basis of Gnostic cosmology is that the God in the Old Testament and the God in the New Testament that Jesus represents are not the same being. Under this, the God in the Old Testament is often referred to as the Demiurge and seen as a force of evil. They believe that the world and the people were created by the evil God, which tainted everything with sin. Others believe that the two gods were dual rulers and equals. The research I found seemed kind of split on which version of this the Cathars followed, but they were definitely Gnostic. It seems the Cathars also tended to think of the Holy Spirit as the angels that were still in heaven. They also read their scripture in the common language, which was not common at the time. The Cathars also believed in reincarnation. This led to the Cathars being pescatarian since they thought that humans could be reincarnated into animals. Fish didn't count because like a lot of people in the Middle Ages, they considered fish and a lot of other small creatures who generate spontaneously. This remained a widely accepted fact till people like Louis Pasteur started working on germ theory in the 1800s, by the way. The core of the Cathars' beliefs was that if they completely rejected the material world, they would stop being reincarnated and go to heaven. This led to some beliefs that put them at odds with the others around them. They believed that sex for the purpose of procreation was wrong because it would lead to a soul being trapped on earth. Also, they believed the body was just a vessel holding a soul, so whether you were a man or a woman didn't matter since that was just an aspect of your disgusting material body. They also didn't have much of a hierarchy. They had normal believers and they had people called bonhams, who went through a number of rituals including baptism and pledging to lead an ascetic life. The bonhams were not quite the same role as a priest, but more like the examples for everyone to live by and acted as mentors. From what I could find, all the bonhams were considered to be roughly on the same level. There were a few bishops at any given time, but they were more like supervisors for areas that were there to help with problems. The Cathars started to gain the attention of the church in 1147 when they sent the first of many papal legates to try and dissuade the Cathars. A papal legate is someone the Pope has authorized to act on the church's behalf. The church tried to get the Cathars to stop their funny business, first by preaching to the Cathars, and later by sending armies. Across multiple popes, the church continued to try and destroy the Cathar movement. The Dominican order was even created in response to the Cathars. Saint Dominic decided after meeting the Cathars in 1203 that you could only convert people as zealous as the Cathars by matching them. He said, Zeal must be met by zeal, humility by humility, false sanctity by real sanctity, preaching falsehood by preaching truth. Dominic was not enough to convert the Cathars, however. In 1209, the crusade began with the massacre at Beziers. Beziers is a city in southern France that at the time had a large population of Cathars. Abbot Ahmad Amalric was at the head of an army of crusaders sent to take care of the Cathars. They laid siege to the city of Beziers. Legend says the abbot gave the order, kill them all, God will know his own. Beziers had a population in the range of 10 to 14,000. Everyone who stayed was killed. The crusade went from town to town, wiping out the Cathars eventually with the direct support of Louis VIII of France. The crusade and the later Inquisition continued until 1350, when it was believed that the Cathars were completely gone. It's hard to put an exact number, but as many as one million people may have been killed by this campaign. Many weren't even Cathars. They were just nearby, so they were killed as well. Cathars caught by the Inquisition were subject to punishments ranging from having to wear a yellow cross over their garments to show penance, to being sent to the Holy Land to die in another crusade, or direct execution. This was the first crusade against Christians and is often considered to be a genocide. After this, more crusades were waged against other groups of Christians, but few if any were as thorough in destroying an entire group of people. Next topic. In 
1814, a child was born in Hua County in China, named Hong Hu Xiu. Hong grew up wanting to work for the Qing Dynasty's bureaucracy. In order to get one of those jobs, you had to pass a civil service exam. Hong kept taking the exam and just couldn't pass. On his way to the second exam, he stopped and listened to a Christian missionary speak. He also took some pamphlets. This would lead to the deaths of over 20 million people. In 1837, after failing the test for a third time, he had a nervous breakdown. While he was recovering, Hong said he had a vision. He said that he met a heavenly family that he was part of, complete with father, mother, and siblings. The father told Hong that the people on earth needed to worship himself instead of demons. He also apparently gave Hong a golden sword and a seal to kill demons that were infesting heaven. He was also told that his new heavenly older brother would help him. The father also told Hong to change his name to Hong Chuen. Also apparently Confucius was being whipped in the background. After this vision, the people around him apparently noticed that he was like a new man. He was more personal and taller. He spent the next six years working as a teacher at different schools near his hometown. He tried taking the test one more time and again failed. After this though, he read the pamphlets that he got from that missionary six years earlier. Keeping a pamphlet for that long without reading it seems like the least likely part of the story so far. After reading these pamphlets, he had a revelation. The man that he met in his dream was God, and his older brother in the dream was Jesus Christ himself. That makes him the younger brother of Jesus. After this realization, he started telling people about his new version of Christianity, and telling people how evil he thought Confucianism and Buddhism was. He also had two large swords made so he could kill demons, obviously. He also began converting people to his new version of Christianity, mostly his relatives who were also part of the Hakka ethnic group. The two important ones for the story from this time were Feng Yunshan and Hong Rengen. They started to go to small villages and destroy the objects of their faith, and the villagers were understandably angry. This led to Hong and his cousins losing their teaching jobs. Our main characters then wandered around preaching the good word for the next few years. Hong also started to write his own literature and studied under an American Southern Baptist missionary. They had steadily grown their following, and Fang gave it the name God Worshipping Society. A few moments later, Fang was banished, and Hong went to find him. While they were gone, two of their followers, Ying Xiaoqing and Zhao Chaogui, suddenly gained the ability to also speak to the heavens. But Yang could only talk to God, and Zhao could only talk to Jesus. When Fang and Hong got back, they confirmed that this was true. Fang, Yang, Zhao, and two later leaders named Wei Changgui and Shi Dakai would come also to be known as Brothers of Jesus. They all continued to minister and spread their version of Christianity through their own version of tent revivals learned from the Baptist missionaries. Hong also wrote his own version of the Bible and started to give it to his followers saying that it was an ancient Chinese version of the Bible that was hidden by the other religions. The actual religion Hong preached was a strange jumble of different Chinese mythologies, folklore, and Christianity that was adjusted to fit Hong's stories. He even had his own take on the nature of Jesus. Hong would say that Jesus was just God's oldest son. All of his miracles were God working through him. He also considered Jesus to be a servant to God and not an equal. Jesus was considered to be above Hong and the other sons in the organization though since he was the oldest. Around 1850, things really started to take off. Hong had tens of thousands of followers and this was when the government started to take notice. Authorities came to tell them to break it up and then later attack them when they said no. The God Worshipping Society defeated the Imperial troops that were sent after them, which led to an even bigger force being sent the next year. And once again, the Imperial troops were defeated. Hong then notified his followers that they were now part of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. They soon began to expand their kingdom, and eventually settled on Nanjing as their capital after they took it by force. While there, they killed upwards of 40,000 members of the Manchu ethnic group because Hong's dream had said they were evil. They also began to institute a number of policies. These included the banning of footbinding, declaring old people equal regardless of sex and class, the abolishment of private land ownership, switching to a solar calendar, and a number of modernization policies like a patent system and promoting the use of trains and steamships. Also one of their stranger policies was that men and women were separated to the point that for a few years married couples were not allowed to live together. Also during this period, Hong started to stay in his inner chambers and give his followers written orders while lounging with the women he kept in those chambers. Yang, who was the guy that could talk to God but not Jesus, began running a lot of the day to day. He would also argue with Hong whose orders had gotten more and more ridiculous. Yang was then killed. Then in 1859, Han Rengen, who was one of the cousins he converted at the start, showed up and was quickly made one of the top leaders in the organization. Rengen had come up with a plan to defeat the Imperial forces that had been attacking Nanjing while all this was happening, as well as a way to expand their territory. Taiping's forces went and attacked another city nearby which caused the army that was besieging Nanjing to leave to back up that city. 
Taiping's forces then quickly headed towards Nanjing, so that all of their forces could encircle the army that had been attacking them. After this, the Taiping forces began conquering provinces on the way to Shanghai. They had also recruited many new members before the march and along the way. They were estimated to have an army that was around 2 million strong. The provinces they conquered were some of the most wealthy and populated in the country at the time. Millions of civilians were killed during this march, both directly and from starvation and disease during the sieges. Although the Qing dynasty did take census of their population regularly, the Taiping forces destroyed a lot of infrastructure. This on top of the damage done by the Opium Wars that had happened just a few years earlier, and the unrest after Taiping and the later Boxer Rebellion, means records are sparse. There was a census from 1851 that showed that the populations of the provinces involved was about 170 million. Sixty years later, the population of those areas was 105 million. It's hard to know how much of that decline was from Taiping's attacks, and how much the population rebounded after. There are many different figures for how many casualties came from this. They range from 20 million to 90 million. I am not an expert, so I am not going to try and argue for a particular figure. I will tell you that this was definitely one of the deadliest events in history. It probably had a death toll similar to World War I, but everyone was from the same country. The march was the beginning of the end for Taiping, though. Taiping began their siege of Shanghai in 1862. Forces made up of regular members of the Qing army, western forces who were in the city largely due to the aftermath of the Opium Wars, and quickly trained recruits from local villages defended Shanghai successfully. After this, the Imperial Army began to reclaim territory and push the Taiping forces back towards Nanjing. In 1862, the Imperial forces began a siege of Nanjing. By 1864, the city was running low on food. It didn't help that Hong had abdicated his position, and his 15-year-old son was now in charge, who despite being the nephew of Jesus, was not an effective leader. One day, Hong went out and tried to forage for plants to eat. Shortly after, he fell sick and died 20 days later. It is unknown if he picked poisonous plants on purpose as a way of committing suicide, or if he just sucked at making weed salad. Shortly after he died, Nanjing also fell. The followers in Nanjing almost all fought and died instead of surrendering. As many as 100,000 followers died after the Imperial forces breached the walls. Hong's body was dug up to verify that he actually died. He was then dismembered, cremated, and then put in a cannon and shot out so that his spirit would never find peace. Afterwards, some parts of Taiping continued to resist and were pursued by the Imperial Army. By 1866, the last remnants of Taiping had either been captured or killed, and the god-worshipping society was effectively gone. Following these events, the Qing Dynasty took its revenge on the Hakka people. Millions were killed, sometimes as many as 30,000 in a day. This whole affair is viewed differently by different groups of people from what I found. It is often referred to as the Taiping Rebellion, but it's also called the Taiping Revolution and the Taiping Civil War. It can be viewed as a cult leader trying to seize power. It can be seen as one of many uprisings in the era against the Qing dynasty. Mao Zedong and the Chinese Communist Party saw it as a predecessor to their communist revolution. It seems like it almost acts like a Rorschach test that appears differently depending on your worldview. What is definitely true is that it is one of the most important events in Chinese history and probably played a role in the tumultuous decades that followed. That's all I have for you. I hope you have a great day and eat something good.